All right, let's start with what questions you have. Okay. Now, I have just a, uh, 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 like I said, I have two companies that are dormant, and um, one is Veterans Housing LLC, and the other one is um, Citizens Assets Returns mm -hmm. LLC. And what I want to do is use these two dormant companies um, to do government contracts. I'll start with one first. And, um, and what do I need to do? I'm, I'm an African-American, so I, I know I can register, I get some, some of these certificates here, but um, the 8A is going to have to wait after, for a year for that one. Um, but um, I can do a, a minority one. Um, a certificate. Um, I'd have to call the local people here in Richmond to find out how to um, register with that situation. But um, other than that, um, my thing is, if I am those nice, nice NACE codes, if you sign up with a NACE code for one thing and it, I guess it doesn't matter if you bid on other things that have that are not listed under your nice codes. You can you don't have to have a nice code listed for everything that you bid on. Okay, that's why I was under I was under the wrong impression then. Okay, yeah, that's that's a misunderstanding. Some purchasing agents think that you do, but you don't. That's actually a. Uh, incorrect. Uh, matter of fact, it's it's such a common incorrect problem. I actually have a signature in my email uh, with the link to the article because it's it's comes up that that uh, frequently. Uh, let's see here, where is it? Next. Okay, so I'm not the only one asking this then. Okay. Correct. Uh, there's a link in on my article regarding this. So anytime a purchasing agent tells you that you have to have a NAX code listed in your SAM in order to bid on or be awarded or get paid on an opportunity, that is incorrect. And okay. uh, I know for a fact because one of my clients a couple of years ago uh, won a contract and one of his competitors did a bid protest and submitted a bid protest to the GAO. And this is the actual... This is the article I wrote regarding it, and this is the actual letter that the GAO responded to his bid protest and said his bid protest was denied. Because you okay. don't have okay. to have NAX codes listed in SAM or in FBO in order to bid on or be awarded or get paid on a contract. Now, if you ever have a contractor that says that you do, a purchasing agent that says that you do, um, and they are, they are telling you that you have to, go ahead and email me. And we'll add it temporarily, and then I will follow up with the purchasing agent, and I will show them that they are, in fact, incorrect. So gotcha. I don't want gotcha. you to okay. with them and in creating a bad relationship. I will be the bad guy. That is, um, that is just fine, just fine. Um, um, because, because when I was looking at the uh, TV guy, I was like, well, this guy just does TVs, and he's bidding on – Jet fuel <laughs> and stuff, and that has nothing to do with televisions and stuff like that. So it must not be where you have to do that. Yeah, he's not jet fuel guy. He's he's TV guy. Right. And so, uh, he, doesn't matter what codes you have listed. It doesn't matter the name of your company. Uh, doesn't matter that you work out of your home. You're a one man show. I mean, I, I'm sure there are some situations where federal purchasing agents will take that uh, and use that against you, but they're not supposed to. So, gotcha. you know, in the long run, in the grand scheme of things, you're better off having a real business and uh, multiple employees and, and, you know, having a business name that's directed towards what you're doing. And you're better off um, having a cap statement that's specific to each NAX code. I mean, there are things that you're going to do that are going to benefit you that, um, you know, but they're not supposed to use those things against you. So in the beginning, it's no big deal. In the beginning, we work with what we got. After you win a contract and make some money, then we'll be more specific and, and you can, you know, start other companies that have specific names geared towards each category. And you can run them as okay. sister companies, so you can still use your past performance. Okay, great. Now, the, the, the cap statements, 
uh, capabilities. Um, I remember watching your videos to talk about that it's IES on the end, not Y. So um, um, do, do I, I submit that with each um, contract, with each, with each bid? You only submit with the bid what the federal purchasing agents are asking you to do. Following the instructions in a bid is extremely important. And more people okay. lose opportunities not because of their price, but because they didn't follow instructions. Okay, and do you help me, do you assist me with making sure I've filled it out correctly? Of course, of course. I'm going to teach you everything I know. Okay. You might okay. have heard me talk Great. about a video, because uh, I provide proposal writing services too. Uh, when I first got into doing proposals, I didn't write them, I referred people to proposal writers, because I didn't mm -hmm. think I had enough experience to write proposals. And I used to uh, refer people to uh, one specific proposal writer, uh, and he put together a proposal for a client of mine for a nuclear power plant, it was a couple of billion dollars, and he lost, Ooh. they lost the, the bid. We did a bid protest, in, uh, not a bid protest, we did a debriefing, and the purchasing agent told us, sent an email saying, uh, we, my client was his first choice. He would have hired my client, but my client made a, a minor amateur, basic amateur mistake. And that's they forgot to include the bid bond along with the proposal, with the bid. Well, right. the client bought the bid bond. They gave it to the proposal writer. He failed to attach it. Oh, okay. So they okay. lost a Got contract it. worth billions over the fact that they didn't follow the instructions. Or not that they didn't follow the instructions. The proposal writer that I referred them to didn't follow the instructions. Okay. Which, which so came back on me, making me look bad because I referred them. So from that point forward, I stopped referring people to other proposal writers, and I learned to write proposals. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So in fact, I wrote one last year that was just awarded. It's over a hundred million dollars. Wow, that's not bad. <laughs> no, not at all. And that's just <laughs> one. Um, <clears throat> let me do this for you. Let me send you this email. Do I have to have a, a proposal with each bid? I mean, is that how it works? Every bid is different. So we're going to work on each bid individually. All right? Got you. Once you so, do a few of so them, you I, get comfortable. You know, once you do a few and you get comfortable, it's going to get a lot easier. And every time you submit a bid, you're creating templates for future bids down the road. Okay. So if I find something on Fed Bid Ops, um, before I submit anything, I contact you to let you know what I'm getting ready to do? When, when we get you registered, you're going to start getting opportunities to bid on automatically. When you find ones that you okay. want to work on, you're going to email me the link and we're going to work on them together. Is that the simplified acquisition situation? Simplified, simplified acquisitions are a type of purchase that the government makes. It's where they can buy from you without putting it out for bid. Uh, they don't have to collect the rule of two. They don't have to collect two bids anymore. They can hire you with only one offer received. And, uh, okay. and they tend to prepay on those. Okay, I'll give you a prime example. This contract right here, for example. This is a client of ours. Uh, he only did a million dollars in revenues last year, which sounds like a lot. But when you got 13 employees and you got payroll and everything else to make, you know, he, he might have made, I don't know, $100,000 in profit, you know? So in right. the grand scheme of things, a million dollars in business isn't a whole lot. It's nice to be able to brag and say you did a million, you know, but. Um, he's a better known small business, right? They did this as a simplified acquisition. See that right there? <clears throat> yeah. It was a sole source for a service disabled veteran. Look at how many offers received. One. Now, you ready for this? He only did a million dollars in revenues last year, right? Right. The government awarded him a $1 billion contract with a B. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. No, I'm not. They paid him $750,000 up front. 
He's going to collect three point one three million over. I don't know if they're going to be paying a monthly or, or quarterly or whatever. I'd have to do the math. <clears throat> Probably monthly. Seven hundred fifty thousand wow. of one billion is point. 075, so that would be probably for the bid bond. That would be the cost of the bid bond, which they paid him up front, so he had the money to afford the bid bond. Got you. <clears throat> All right. And this, wow. okay. that's one that, you know, I just taught the vendor. He, he submitted the bid himself. I didn't actually write that one for him. He did it. I just taught him how and helped him with it. Um, here's one. No. Oh, here it is. It's notice of award right here. So this is what an actual award letter looks like. These guys won this contract. Uh, this is one that they paid me to write the proposal on actually last year. It took them six months to award this, but it's a $100 million contract. So right. you know, they, they don't typically award larger contracts like that just immediately, unless it's a, a purchase for FEMA or something like that. They need it quickly. I wrote this proposal in October. Uh, our team wrote it and uh, submitted it in October. It was supposed to be awarded in November, and I got postponed. It got postponed from December. It got postponed to January, February, March. It was starting to, to not look good. At least the, my client was starting to think that. You know, I, I told him, I said, Some, I've seen these things take a year to award, especially if they're bigger like this. Uh, right. About 20 days ago, he had a phone call from the purchasing agent asking him if his prices were still good because they typically only hold pricing for 30 days or 60 days. And he told the purchasing agent, yeah, the pricing is still good. And then he called me and he said, hey, a purchasing agent called me and asked me if the prices are good. And I said, congratulations, you won it. He goes, what do you mean? You won the bid. If he's going to call you and ask you if your pricing is still good, he's not going to do that for the heck of it. You know, right, he's right. not going to waste his time. And he's not going to call everybody and ask them if they're if he chooses you, he's going to want to know if your pricing is still good because it's past the 30 or the 60-day mark. That means you want it. And he goes, well, we'll see. I don't want to put on, you know, get, get my hopes up. And here it is. It was awarded. Yep, it takes congratulations. Yep. Yeah. This is a yeah, so $25 million contract for a year for five years. Okay. I and this is what's called an IDIQ, which stands for indefinite and delivery indefinite quantity, which means they're going to guesstimate how many orders they're going to make, but they always, always underguesstimate. Uh, the very first contract that I ever worked on in 2009 when I started here was with the mortuary guy, and it was an IDIQ, and he and I worked on it together, and uh, they were guesstimating between 10 and 50 orders a month. His first order was 580 something in one month when they estimated the maximum to be 50. So more than likely, this is 21.5 million a year. It's probably going to be, who knows, it could be 50 or 100 million a year. This thing could turn into a $500 million contract or more. Wow. You never know until and you get going and they, they place their first order. The first month will tell you typically what the rest of the contract is going to be like. Right, right. And when you, when I see these contracts, and let's say you win a million dollar contract, and let's say that I do one of these um, these broker deals, and it's for three million. Mm -hmm. I still have to pay the person who I'm getting this stuff for, so I'm not going to make three million. I'm going to make the difference between what I'm paying this paying these people for and what the government is paying me. Correct, correct. So, well, I mean that contract right there. They're a dental company. They make dental prosthetics. So they're going to keep more of the profits because they're actually the company supplying it. When you broker contracts, you're just going to make your markup, which is what TV Guy does. You know, same thing. Uh, uh, Herb over at Pyramid Technologies. I taught him how to broker. He won his first contract. A lot of people actually win their first bid. Believe it or not, I, I probably have more yeah. people that win their first bid than um, than um, at least half of my clients win their first bid. It happens all the time. And my right, client success right, ratio right. is right now is almost ninety percent. So ninety percent of my clients will win at least one contract their first year. 
Well, winning that first one is important. Well, not the exact first one, but once I've won one, it, it, I can officially say that I am a government vendor, so that's Correct. why it's important. Correct, and you can brag about it. You've got bragging rights. That's prestige, you know? Yeah, yeah. So what about, have you run across anyone that says, I want to provide housing to veterans, or does the government need any leasing of buildings or oh, yeah. things of that nature? I've got a client that does veteran housing contracts right now out in California. As a matter of fact, he's getting on a GSA schedule because they're, they're wanting him to do larger, longer-term contracts. He has to do GSA to do it. Right, right. And that's what um, I was speaking with a friend of mine here about because he has a nonprofit. And he said, well, I'm looking for a place where I can house more veterans. Yes. Um, and and um, because his place... Yeah, his place is only 20, can hold 20 people, and it's transitional housing. And um, I'm like, well, you know what? I'd like to house veterans because my nephew is a sergeant in the Marines, and I want to do something, you know, if I can, sure, sure. To, house, to house veterans Let or anyone else. Let me explain. I got a, when, when I first started here, 2009, I had a guy call me up one day, and he goes, listen, I, I hope you can help me. He says, I'm not sure where to go from here. Um, he says, I want to help veterans. And, uh, you know, I want to help them any way I can. So I, I've been finding veterans that are, you know, sleeping on the side of the road or in the woods. And I, I bring them into my home and I feed them and, and I, I teach them the word of God and I give them a place to sleep. But he said, I, I'm kind of enabling them in a, well, in a way because a lot of them the next, very, next day they go back out and they do more drugs. You know, I'm not helping right. them get off the drugs. So I said, well, let's let's think about this. We brainstormed. We talked about it for a bit and, and came up with several solutions. And I said, number one, you need to stop bringing these guys in your home. Okay? I understand right, right. your passion and your love for helping people, but you're bringing drug addicts into your home. You just told me a story about sitting around the dinner table with your two daughters, 13 and 12. No, no, man. You can't be bringing people into your home anymore. All right? got to right, stop that right, right now. All right. I, again, I'm not trying to sound like a bad guy or be a jerk here, but you're putting yourself and your, you and your family in physical harm by bringing total strangers that are addicted to drugs into your home. So the first thing we need to do is figure out how to, you can help them without bringing them into your home. Um, right. We, we worked on a few things, but what we wound up figuring out in the long run, he applied for a grant, and he got a grant to buy an apartment building. And he got a grant to remodel and to get the apartment building fixed up. And then he talked a doctor and a nurse into uh, living there for free if they would donate their time several, whatever it was, a couple of days a week or whatever, to see these veterans uh, without them having to go to the VA. Because if you want to go to the VA, you know, if you had your regular checkup or whatever, you put in a request, it could be 60, 90 days before you get in. I had one mm -hmm. veteran, um, he was sleeping behind a, 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 a grocery store, and uh, I happened to find him one morning, and he was all beat up and bloody, and, and uh, I asked him if he was okay, and he, he could barely talk. Uh, he said, he, you know, he's a veteran, and he was, he's homeless, and these punks came through last night and found him sleeping in a box, and, and they beat him up. They kicked him, kicked him and punched him and hit him with, with wood uh, sticks and, and you know, they, they hit him so hard in the face that his false teeth came out. They stole his false teeth. He said, you have no hey. idea. It's going to take me two to three months to get an appointment at the VA to see a dentist. And then it'll take him nine months to make a new set of teeth. He goes, I now have to go for an entire year without teeth because of this. So this yeah, guy, yeah, the you know, so, so he applied for a grant bought an apartment building, convinced a doctor and a nurse to stay there to, you know, provide free services. At least they can't, you know, provide doctor services. You can't prescribe outside of the hospital, but at least they can tell you, hey, you can use this over the counter or, you know, they give them advice. So and eventually uh, he started teaching these guys. Number one, they had to take a, um, a drug program where they had to stay off drugs. And then he would teach them how to start their own business. He would help them start a business and help them win government contracts. Wow, that's great. So he wasn't just enabling yeah. them. He was actually doing something in, in benefiting veterans. Right, right. Yeah, well, I, I tried to, um, I saw on FedBit, FedBit Ops uh, a couple of weeks ago 
about providing housing here in the Richmond area. Mm -hmm. And I called the purchasing guy down in, in Norfolk, and he said, well, this one is not just for housing. I couldn't get it anyway because I didn't have my SAM or anything. I wasn't set up, but I was curious. So I called him, and he said, we prefer this to be part of an overall situation where the person is providing uh, health services or rehab and stuff like that. Right. So I said, okay, well, there's nothing I can do because all I really want to do is house them. And um, so I let it go, but it was just <laughs> interesting to actually talk to an actual purchasing guy down there to see. <clears throat> and then he told me about some 26-page application that had to be filled out. And I'm like, holy crap. <clears throat> you know, it just seems like so much you got to do just to put a bid in for something. Well, it depends on the opportunity. There's, there's a lot of opportunities have an 80, 90, 100 page document, but 85 percent, 85 to 90 percent uh, of those pages are your reps and certs, which all you have to do is download out of SAM. So they're, they're rarely as complicated as they seem. You know, unless you're bidding on a nuclear power plant or construction of a VA or something extremely complicated. Mm -hmm. Now that's another thing. The reps and the, uh, if, if this is a Dormant company. Am I going to have a lot of that stuff to put to put there on my website? Are you going to have a lot of what? You said the the reps and the certs. If I heard you correctly, the reps and certs. They, that's the legal side of doing business for the government. And if you work with us, we're going to do all that for you. So all you have to do when you submit a bid is download that document and attach it. That's 90% of your bid right there. <laughs> fantastic. That is fantastic. Okay. Now, these proposals and things that you're going to be writing, um, how, uh, uh, is that an extra price I'm going to be paying yes. for those other things? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, every every oh. proposal is different. Every bid is different. So to tell you, you know, I'm going to charge you X dollars to write this bid when I haven't even seen it yet, I can't do that, you know. Right, right. Okay. Well, well, great, great. Well, those are, are, are um, you know, some of the areas, like I said, I'm interested in is veterans housing. But when it comes to doing broker contracts, what area should, do you think I should focus on? Or Any, does it really matter? doesn't matter. Anything you get your hands on, because you can use those contracts that you're brokering also to fund your cause. Got you. You can Got help you. Okay. Not only help them give them a place to stay, but you can have them work with you and help you win these contracts, and they can make money off of it. Okay. All you right. Know? Great. So I can I can leave myself open to receiving information from the government when they I will automatically let me put this way, I will automatically receive information on bids when the government needs housing. Yes, absolutely. You're going to get those emails automatically. I'm going to show you how to set up your searches by keyword. You'll never miss out. Okay. All right. And and um, you mentioned grants. Is that separate from me doing bids? It is a separate process. Uh, we will get you registered for grants, and then you can either go use a program like Grant Seeker Pro to help you write for the grant or you can hire a professional to write for the grant for you. Okay, my wife is already using that company for her barter exchange because uh, she wants to receive. Yes, yeah, she wants to receive a reasons. grant. Sure, yeah. Right, right. Now, the government doesn't do any bartering, do they? No, I mean, they do have a, uh, the government has a um, surplus where, let's say they're going to, uh, Scrap. I'm trying to think of a good ex. A good. Um, okay. Let's say they've got a military facility, or not even a military facility. Let's say the government has a gun range, and it's a really old gun range. And you know how gun ranges? They have to have some type of wall on the back that's at an angle. Yes. So it collects the bullets. It's as a, a angled wall where the bullets ricochet off of, and they go into a collection device or something. Uh, used to be back in the day, they made those walls out of lead. So the bullet would hit it and not bounce off, not ricochet, but it, it softens the blow and it would just fall to the ground. 
But when they, they, they stopped using those facilities because of lead poisoning, because of dust, and they started using other options. But they, maybe, maybe the government has an old uh, gun range that they want to uh, demolish. Someone has to come in and pull that lead, you know, and, and uh, it would be through a um, um, hazardous waste removal, you know. Well, they might pay you to remove the lead. But then again, they might tell you you can have it for free if you do the demo work for free, and then you can scrap the lead. I've seen both. I've seen okay, station exactly. where they were uh, giving away brass shells, brass uh, gun shells, and they weren't paying you to come get them. You had to come get them for free, but you could scrap mm -hmm. them. And I've seen uh, situations where they uh, might pay you a little bit, or you have to bid on it. The government sells gold sometimes, and obviously they're not going to give you a contract to come remove gold for free. You have to bid on it. So there are some ways that the government does barter, but that's pretty much it. It's in the demolition area or uh, dis or scrapping, you know. Okay. Now, I've been reading. I've been reading quite a bit recently about the government not having enough parts for the aircraft. Um, is there a way where I can help in that area? To do what? To supply them with the parts that they need for these grounded aircraft. Are they are they putting bids out there to say we need this such and such equipment, and um, you know, um, because I mean that that's what I've been reading. I don't know if they've resolved the issue. Of, of, of getting parts they need for their aircraft? No, they're always buying or, parts for aircraft, man, and they buy used parts sometimes, too. Right, right. So do they put bids out for stuff like this, or sometimes. they just find them on their own? Sometimes. Sometimes they put them out. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do it as a simplified acquisition. Okay. Okay. And um, the reason I was interested in what the TV guy was doing and the fact that you talked about uh, brokering is I'm in Virginia. We have one of the biggest military, you know, installations here in Norfolk in the country. And I was saying to myself, if he is supplying the government with fuel, the military, and all this other stuff, I could look for bids and stuff to supply people in Norfolk and our military bases with stuff and different contracts that apply to them as well. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, all kinds of opportunities out there. You can sell anything and get your hands on. Okay. Aircraft's okay. I'm okay. not going to sugarcoat it. I never will. I'm always always tell you facts. Uh, aircraft yeah. parts is a very competitive arena, but um, right, right. You know, that's why if you look, TV guy doesn't do a whole lot of it. He does mostly petroleum and, and butane and stuff like that. Right, right. I see that. I see that. Well, that's why I'm I'm going to be using you as a resource to help me in this area of, of, of contract of, of brokering contracts. Now, one other thing is I also did some research and found out that that real estate brokers make money also by leasing places to the federal government. Yes, the government rents um, properties, they rent buildings, they they lease properties and buildings. They buy properties and buildings. They sell properties and buildings. Pretty much, if you could envision something, the government buys it or sells it in some way, shape, or form. I've yet to find okay. something our federal government does not buy. And for, for a long time, it was a running joke here to see who could find something that our government doesn't buy. But our government buys right. everything. They buy marijuana. Right. They buy porn. It's, it's mind-boggling. <laughs> Why would the government buy porn? For research purposes. You know? <laughs> Yeah. I've seen one well, contract in one day where the government bought uh, some insanely amount of marijuana, like $80 million of marijuana. And in the same day, they had a contract where they were paying someone to destroy $40 million worth of marijuana. Oh, man. Gee whiz. You know, I, got, I get people that are like, well, that's just government waste. Well, I mean, technically, no. <laughs> If they, they seized this marijuana over the last 10 years, the FBI did, and they finally closed all the cases, this stuff's been sitting in some warehouse for 10 years now. It's no good anymore. 
and right. it was seized and it wasn't grown by legal means. There's no telling what they used to grow it. So uh, it had to be destroyed. It couldn't be used. And then the marijuana right. that they're buying is medical marijuana for blah, blah, blah. So that has to be purchased, you know. Right, right. Well, the reason I brought up the real estate is because um, I used to uh, uh, flip houses, you know, and I was in the real estate business, and I always wanted to get into the commercial space. So um, when I found out that you can lease the, a, a, as a broker, act as a broker and lease stuff to the uh, federal government, you know, I don't know if they put that stuff out to bid, but um, I would love to check into that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, our government says okay. everything, buys everything from paper clips to spaceships. Um, I thought okay. I finally found, I had a guy call me up one day and said he wanted to sell yo-yos to the government. And I'm like, I gotcha. There's no way our government buys yo-yos, right? And I, no, I can't believe that. Well, I thought it was a friend of mine pulling my leg, just messing around with me, right? Right. So I asked him, and he got kind of got upset with me, you know, the, like I was insulting him. And he says, look, I already sell yo-yos to the government. And I'm, I still think he's joking. I still think there's a friend pulling my leg. So I was like, okay, I'm listening. He goes, what? I, I, I've been doing this for years. I make like the Redwood Forest. He makes yo-yos out of Redwood. He puts the right. – uh, the um, the federal park or the state park, he puts their logo on the yo-yo. He actually makes these little things like when you brand a cow. <clears throat> right. You know, he makes these things. You heat up in a fire, and he burns the, the logo of the, the, the forest, the, the state park or federal park, onto the yo-yo. And he sells those to the park, and they resell them in their gift shop. Well, pff, that makes perfect sense, you know. When he said he wanted to sell yo-yos to the government, I'm thinking – for who? Congress? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I can believe that. Yeah. But, um, okay, all right, so <clears throat> I guess um, what I need to know about is pricing, and I need to get some ideas about what I'm interested in Absolutely. as far as my, my plan of attack here, as far as the type of things that I want to, um, how, how long does it take to get approved for the simple, simplified acquisition? Simplified acquisitions, that whole process can usually be knocked out in about two weeks. It, it, it boils down to how quickly you fill out the forms. So you fill out the first set of worksheets, they fill out, the, they do the first process. Then you'll get notified, you, you probably have to reply to an email, and then that, that'll get your SAM active, and then the second step, uh, it's to get you registered for uh, Simplified Acquisitions and then include a website with that program and several other steps. So as long as you fill out those worksheets every time they request it, it only takes a week or two. Okay, okay. Now, um, the, I, um, the, the SAM thing, you register me with SAM. Even if you've already done your SAM, we're going to go back in and redo it. Because there's no sense you and I investing our time putting bids together, and then you submit a bid and don't win it, and you go in and request a debriefing, and the purchasing agent says, well, I would have awarded it to you, but you weren't compliant in SAM to begin with. Okay. All right? And if you I make a mistake you. in SAM and the government thinks it's on purpose, they can fine you. That you can, you can do jail time if they think you're trying to cheat the system. So your case manager is going to go back through all of that and redo it for you and make sure it's done correctly, and then they sign off on it. They take the legal responsibility of doing it correctly. It takes the liability off of you completely. Okay. All right. Great. Right. The, the Great. two things that you well, need to be investing your time doing is submitting okay. bids, you know, putting together and submitting bids, and uh, investing right. some time once a week to pick up that phone. And make some phone calls. Introduce yourself to some primes. Ask them what you can do to earn their business. Introduce yourself to some purchasing agents. Ask them what you can do to earn their business. Market yourself directly, and I'll teach you how to do that. I'm going to help you write your elevator pitch. We'll build your cap statement for you. All you got to do is take the time to make the calls and submit the bids. Yes, I, I was looking at um, um, some of your uh, uh, elevator uh, speeches. Mm -hmm. And um, they're very interesting, and um, I'm already practicing one of them now. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it, it's it's you know, I'm 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 already learning from your videos, Excellent. from your YouTube stuff. Excellent.
So, um, you know, and that's, that's aside from the, the, the simplified acquisition stuff. This is just extra stuff I'm doing to get more and more people to know about me and what I do. Sure, sure. And that's, that's uh, you know, one of the okay. steps is to getting your name out there in front of these guys and, and drumming up business while you're submitting bids. I'm going to teach you how to attack the system from every angle. You know, it's a matter of sitting okay. down and making the calls and submitting the bids. Wow, wow. And see, that's what the, these gurus don't tell you when they talk about when you look on there and they talk about getting government contracts. They don't tell you that you need to have your SAM or, you know, or, or all these other little things that you're talking about in order to get approved or to win these bids. Yeah. You know, they don't, they don't tell you the whole story. No, it's, it's funny because I, I, it's kind of a full circle thing. Uh, when I uploaded this picture of my daughter, um, and the bib said cake, please. I just wanted a picture of my daughter on my computers because so I could look at her every day while I was working. And right. it started saying cake, please, you know, because it was on her bib. And uh, I, I even had someone earlier at the end of last year tell me that he didn't think it was very professional that I had a picture of my daughter on my desktop. And I can understand mm -hmm. and from his aspect that he's talking about multi-million dollar contracts, and he's probably right. Unfortunately... For him, uh, fortunately for me, because I don't want to change it, I love this picture, uh, I can't right. change it because uh, we work with government agencies. We, we have information on contractors, you know, um, social security numbers, EIN numbers. We, we have a lot of pertinent information. And because of that, mm -hmm. they don't allow us to upload pictures to our computers anymore. So I can't change the picture even if I wanted to. <laughs> right, but right, but I don't, I don't see that as a problem. What, what is the right, big deal right. with? Uh, you know, picture? some people you'll never make everybody happy all the time. I'll tell you that right now, and, and that's another lesson <laughs> that I teach my clients. I had a client call up one day, and she was in tears. I got a client that's mad at me. So look, it's not necessarily you did anything wrong. You will never ever make one hundred percent of the people happy all the time. It's impossible. You know, but right, right. The, the funny part, the full circle part, is one of my clients called him one day, and he says, "You know what, John Wayne." This is how you're different. Everybody else out there, I watch their videos, and they put the, you know, the, the carrot in front of the horse to make the horse walk. He said, they'll, they'll right. show you the carrot. They might even let you take a little nibble, a little bite off of it, but that's all they're going to mm -hmm. give you is a little bite off the carrot. He says, you don't do that. You give us the whole carrot. And I said, yeah, right. if you want me to make you a carrot cake, then you got to pay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I can understand that. Well, well how, how did... How does this sound? Um, uh, 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 good afternoon, uh, uh, Mr. Wayne. Uh, this is Earl Lewis with Veterans Housing LLC, and um, we're a small uh, uh, DBE certified minority business. I was calling to let you know today that I have sent you my cap statement via your email, and I just wanted to ask you what I could do to earn your business. That's perfect. Perfect. Short, sweet, and to the point. Uh, have you started your your MBE. My what? Have you started your MBE? You said you got your DBE, your disadvantaged business. Have you started your MBE? Uh, no, no. And I'm, I haven't done my DBE. I'm going to be look, getting that straight tomorrow. I'm going down there to speak with them to get that straight. I was just reading it to you to let you know how I've studied your your elevator speech. I can tell you're paying attention because you, you've mentioned several things that I, you know, ways that I tell people to do, and you're doing exactly what I'm telling you. I, I can tell that. You definitely want to eventually get your DBE and your MBE because that will help you get more contracts as a subcontractor with primes. That some primes will hire you just because you hold those, and they'll buy from you. Even though they're paying more, they'll buy from you because you hold those certifications. And those are two of the certifications that we don't do through the Department of Transportation, the DBE and the MBE. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to teach you all this in the grand scheme of things. When were you wanting to start bidding on these types of contracts? Did I lose you? Can you hear me now? Earl, if you can hear me, I can't hear you at all. Looks like you're still in the meeting, but you might have lost signal or something like that. Let me make a note up here in case you can't hear me.
Can you hear me now? There you are. Can you hear me okay? I'm going to assume your phone died and uh, go ahead and end this call and I'll wait to hear back from you.